Namaste, good afternoon, bonjour, tashidile. I'm Sujeev Shakya, welcoming you to this edition of Conversations, hosted jointly by Embassy of France and Bead Knowledge Center. We are very honored to have Matthew Ricard, who, as we all know, has been a thought leader engaged in quest of linking science and Buddhism along with pursuing humanitarian efforts. The format of today's event will be that we will have an opening remarks by Ambassador Francois Xavier Leger, uh, Ambassador of France to Nepal. Thereafter, Mathieu and I will be in conversation for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have about uh, 45 minutes of question and answers. I know you'll all have a lot of questions. Let's see how many we can accommodate. Uh, before I begin, I will have to acknowledge uh, the contribution of a few people to make this event happen. First of all, uh, thank you to Prahlad Kumar uh, and Hotel Himalaya and his team for hosting us. They are, the partnership continues to grow each year. Uh, this wonderful backdrop you're seeing is being uh, its artwork of uh, Bidata Kesi, a well-known artist in Nepal who expresses her creativity uh, across different mediums. She would be here. You can have conversations later with her on what this art is all about. And the curation of this uh, backdrop and the stage has been done by Swasti Kasta Rajmandari. And uh, without uh, further ado, may I request uh, Ambassador Leger to make his opening remarks. So I'm Francois Xavier Leger, French ambassador to Nepal. Uh, I arrived, I've been here now for 15 months. This year, 2019, is the 70th anniversary of the establishment of bilateral relations between France and Nepal. As an embassy, we have organized a lot of events in order to highlight the various aspects of this relation and try also to enhance it. We did political dialogue, commemoration event, business forum, photo expo, gastronomy, francophony, music, and talk show. Beyond all these uh, different activities, we could also feel what has made France Nepal's heart beat since 70 years. Spirituality is also a deep and strong driving force for many French people coming to Nepal. At least our 30,000 trekkers who come here want to make a break, recharge their batteries and replenish spirit. Therefore, I'm very grateful that Mathieu Ricard is kind enough to be with us today is very well known, obviously, and respected in France, not only in France, but all over the world. So it gives us a great opportunity to listen and exchange with Mathieu Ricard in a very privileged way. So I am very grateful that he accepts to devote us some time while he is facing so many responsibilities, spiritual activities, and, as you know well, humanitarian commitment. I would like to warmly thank Sujiv Shakya, and all the BID uh, Nepal Economic Forum friends for being our partner today. I extend also my thanks to Himalaya Hotel for kindly hosting us and supporting this talk. And I'm really impressed, puzzled by this wonderful uh, stage. So I wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I think uh, we are very honored, and I personally feel very honored to have Matula here. We listened to, you know, I've been reading Matula, following Matula a lot, and it's an amazing journey. And it's very little known about him in Nepal. And that's one of the reasons I think for the past three years we've been pursuing him to find some time between his retreats he comes to Nepal to and to, you know, share some of his thoughts to a Nepali audience that uh, perhaps uh, has not uh, been able to have a chance to listen to him at a personal level. So, Matula, maybe we start with your journey uh, coming to Nepal and, you know, how it all began and uh, that would be of interest uh, for the audience. Yeah. yeah, so I'm very grateful for this invitation and meeting many friends, all than you. And, uh, well, my journey to Nepal uh, went through Darjeeling and it started uh, um, by doing a first journey in 1997, 
I'm very bad at remembering dates, but the 2nd of June 1967, I know that, because that's uh, the year at the moment I reached India, went to Darjeeling. My father had the great idea of uh, having me study German, classical Greek, and Latin, <laughs> which I didn't use much because, uh, you know, German I forgot and Latin and Greek is limited use here. But my English was very poor. So I was uh, running around India to get to Darjeeling with a few words of English. Then I met uh, my first teacher, whose name was Kangyu Ramushin, who was a great uh, Tibetan master who had fled from Tibet. So when I went to Darjeeling and met my teacher, you know, I knew nothing about Buddhism. So it was not the theory that I was raised in a, in a more like a, a agnostic sort of environment. But suddenly I saw human beings whose quality as a human being was eminently inspiring. They were an incredible mixture of wisdom and compassion and inner strength and inner freedom. Obviously, there are no personal agenda, nothing to gain, nothing to lose, to have a student more or less, everything to share, everything to give. So I thought, well, if there are such people, maybe it's worth trying to see more. How, how did they get there? Could I walk a few steps in that direction? So I went back and I started a PhD in Pasteur Institute on cell genetics. I went back and forth many times. And then after finishing my PhD, I decided, okay, my postdoc will be in the Himalayas, <laughs> not somewhere else. And so I've been staying there seven years in Darjeeling without returning to France. It was a very formative moment. Until the 80s, that uh, my, my second teacher, Kanselem Boshe, decided that it would be good for the preservation of the Himalayan heritage to build a monastery in, ba in Bauda, at Sechen, where he was mostly staying in Bhutan. So I spent 10 years with him in Bhutan. But then we used to spend the winters here. And so we started to build this monastery, which is now Session Monastery, which cost 600 monks. And so I used to come um, every year then to, to, to Nepal. And after my teacher passed away in 1991, then I mostly stayed here. So, Matila, from the time you came to Nepal and here, you talked about you know, some of the changes that you see walking to the airport, you know, uh, and now all the clutter in between. Apart from that, what are some of the few changes that you've seen in Nepal that has, you know, that has, you know, it could be positive, it could be, you know, otherwise also. What do you, what do you have seen over the past 30, 40 years that has really changed in Nepal? Well, you know, I'm not a political analyst. As one of my colleagues with whom I did the dialogue, I have enough trouble not to do any politics, so. <laughs> but uh, I think I always admire the resilience of uh, Nepalese people. Uh, even at the time where the, there was hardly any government, as you know, yeah. I mean, they still managed to get on with their life. You know, when I was in my hermitage during the Maoist insurgency, one day I would see the Maoists passing, the government, and next day the army passing, <laughs> trying to be out of the picture. But somehow, you know, a good thing that there has not been lasting hatred, because yeah. it wasn't based on on different ethnic groups or religious divisions or whatever. It was a, something that happened, it was bad, but it didn't leave marks that people are, two groups are hating each other yeah. for a long time. So I think that's also part of the, some kind of the culture of tolerance, of openness, and even there are being difficult times. Somehow that, at the end, uh, managed to, yeah, to bring hopefully some more and uh, more harmony. <laughs> so I wish that you know this harmony may prevail even further in the past. No, thank you. I think that's uh, wishful thinking. And uh, yeah, I think we will definitely try to get you an honorary citizen for Nepal. We'll see how that works. Mm -hmm. Uh, so maybe we can move into, you know, there are multiple topics. I think, you know, I mean, we know uh, Matilda has written about so many things as he talked about his photography. There's, but then I think today we just thought to listen to, from you about, you know, sort of, uh, especially some of the recent more work you're trying to do with, you know, Buddhism and science coming together. And as we see a society where there's advent of technology, there's a, a lot of usage of technology, uh, there's artificial intelligence that's, you know, sort of uh, 
being used uh, for a lot of purposes. So in that context, where do you see this? And you know, at the end of the day, it's all about human beings. It's about the human mind. It's about you know people. So where you know how you have seen this evolve? And some of your you know I've marked it, but I want to pull it out. But then some of the you know sort of uh, things you've been saying in the past. You know, how does that will stay still stay relevant? Well, my human values always stay relevant. But you know, everybody is speaking about. I mean, about the emotional intelligence, that would be my thing. Artificial intelligence, like if it was a kind of a mystery of the magic bullet. So clearly, in many areas, it's going to make a big difference. If the prediction that in 30 years, say, in Western countries or developed countries, 80% uh, of the people not only will not be employed, but are unemployable because uh, Artificial intelligence thinks we can better and faster and all that. So then you have to find a different mod economic model, uh, including uh, universal wage for mm -hmm. everyone. Now the other thing is whether it's a kind of threat for what basically humans are. So then we should really be careful. What is artificial intelligence? It's a bunch of algorithms. What is yeah. an algorithm? It's a method of, cal of calculation that helps to determine precisely a, a set of you know, uh, steps that allows to accomplish something, that's all. So now it also can be self-learning. So great, uh, so it increases our capacity and performance. This has nothing to do with value, with compassion or whatever. So it hardly well, it is a narrow definition of intelligence, and so that's what it is. So I think what uh, the notion of artificial intelligence makes us understand is even in a more clear way the difference between intelligence or problem solving and consciousness. Mm. Consciousness is about experience. And if you go deep in consciousness, especially sometimes what meditators do, you can reach to a state of pure awareness. So, in a way, it's a state that is absolutely clear, absolutely vivid, sort of luminous, but devoid of mental constructs, no content. So, this, in a way, it's the opposite of churning data and so forth. And the second big difference is even through artificial intelligence and transhumanism, you could put a chip and know everything that is in all with Wikipedia, that's a lot of information. But that also shows that more than ever the difference between information and wisdom. That doesn't tell you how to live your life, that doesn't tell you how to be a good human being, that doesn't tell you how to be good in society. So what makes a real good human life? To be a good person, to strive yourself, to be at peace, so that when you die in peace, and then to be and to put all that inner transformation at the service of others. So that's completely different realm. So that's why when you say the future of compassion, more than ever, selfishness will not be the magic thread that allows yeah, to yeah. stick together and build a better world. It has to be consideration for others. Then you will have a positive economy with solidarity. You will have, you will breathe, try to bridge the gap of inequality, more social justice. And then you will care genuinely for future generations. So when Greta Thunberg tells us at the UN to heads of state, you are betraying future generations, she's completely right. right. So that lack of consideration for others. So compassion has a bright future because it's the only future. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. But Matilda, but also we see, I mean, this is something we've uh, discussed earlier also. If you look at technology, now people are saying that with technology, you can also resolve these issues, like, you know, there are now apps that tell you about how mindful you are, as you call it, the Mac mindfulness, you know. So again, this is, you know, this is also the churn that's happening, where you are saying that uh, more discoveries around artificial intelligence, more advancement around technology is going to also get you become more compassionate. You can integrate technology. And so this is also a distortion, and a lot of young people we meet, we interact, feel that, you know, this can be resolved by an app. So, so how do you see this? Because this is also a bit uh, not very uh, comfortable as we move ahead. 
So there is a book that came out recently by a French psychologist who has been studying the effect of uh, violent video games, exposure to violent media. You know, to give you a, a, an indication, in Europe, young people see about three and a half hours of TV every day and they, they play a lot with those machines. So at 20 years old, has seen 20,000 violent deaths somewhere on images. What does that to do with reality? You know, I have been here during the Maoist insurgency. I've been in places in India where there were troubles. I must say, I mean, I'm not a war correspondent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes I prefer to be a peace correspondent, a peace reporter. But somehow in all those 50 years, I never saw some people being killed in front of my eyes. So it's certainly not 20,000. And even I was reporting in the genocide, I would not see with my own eyes all those. So this complete distortion. Yeah, so, so and this is also leading to one of the bigger challenges we see as we uh, uh, move ahead is that, you know, on one hand, we are seeing tremendous environmental degradation uh, that we see uh, that's been impacted. At the same time, the sense of gratitude, the sense of, you know, sort of, uh, saying thank yous and just being uh, being thankful to be in this earth and which is a big Buddhist value we talk about. And so how do you see this, you know, the, the encroachment of technology, encroachment of all this and that, that sense of becoming more selfish, you know, more, you know, sort of gaming and doing, you know, becoming self-centered, creating your own little groups, getting more, you know, looking at violent videos and all that. So how does this is going to impact this as we go ahead? Because this yeah. is a big challenge, because what we need is something to do with the shared world and, you know, our shared future. So at the same time, you know, this is a contrary force, hyper-individualism, there's an epidemic narcissism in North America. It's not just uh, because of the, you know, what's happening now. It, it has been studied over 20 years. But at the same time, although there are contrary forces, there's also a lot of good things happening. Yeah. We forget when we speak of violence, because we see it all the time, that violence in the world has been steadily declining for the last five centuries. That's it, full stop. Anyway, so that's, that's the case. It's true even in conflicts, you know, armed conflicts. Com from 1950 till now, the average number of victims per conflict all throughout the world, not, of course, if you just focus on South Sudan or Iraq or something, there's something happening. If you look the whole world, it has decreased the average number of victims per conflict of all kinds, civil war, name it. It went from 30,000 to 1,000, average. So there's something happening there in the good direction. So just looking, I mean, taking the positive thinking a bit forward as we see the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years. So what are the, some of the big trends you see that from a human side, which, you know, of course, we've seen, you know, if you take Buddhism itself, the spread to the West in the past 70 years has been amazing, like people like yourselves, you know, talking about Buddhism, a lot of people coming to Nepal in this area. So, so the, we do see those positive trends also. So what are some of the big things that make you very hopeful? Well, sometimes... Well, I'll tell you one thing. All those progresses, you know, the fact that there is now, we went from, in 20 years, thanks to the millennium plans of the United Nations, from 1.5 million people under poverty to 750 million, that many soon, all children will be in school, all these things. All that could be comp uh, the decline of violence. All that could be jeopardized by the environmental upheavals, by climate change. So people can, can create a powerful ID. You know, Victor Hugo said there's nothing more powerful than an ID, the time of which has come. So I think now this is the time of compassion, of cooperation, of working together, of bringing the best of ourselves at the surface and putting it at the service of the society, of the planet, you know, seeing that eight other million species are not just there as an instrument, they have their own life, they have the right to survive and to thrive. So this kind of awareness is increasingly seen in young people. I think the last European election, uh, the, those elected under 30 years old, majority voted for the Green Party. So they are coming into age, mm. and so that change is much needed. So that's, I think, the challenge we have. Where do you see this, you know, again, connecting? Do, where do you see the, you know, sort of the silver lining where we see that people would come together, there is a probability, and these sort of challenges would be 
you know, mitigated, you know, and then there is, you know, the Buddhist values and so maybe. Well, you know, first of all, the, the, for people to come together, there are many aspects. Let's take the religious aspect. Yeah. So, very often, religions are used as a flag of you know, getting together and separating from each other. Well, that's really no good <laughs> for the world. So, if, if we were just taking what is the most common platform, which even before religion, which is goodness, good heart, compassion. That, there's no religion that first, predi first, first preaching was about hatred. I mean, they all say about universal love, etc. Well, they do not always do that, but that's what they say. So if we just were to recognize that as something where we can all agree, you know, the, the golden rule, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. That could be applied, the world would be so much better. So already, at least religions should work together on that message. Then education. The people say, oh, education should be neutral, should be secular. Fine. Secular, yes, why not? Because you cannot you know, impose any belief on any one young person. They should choose or not when they go. But value, to say that we should not have human values in education because it should be neutral, this is really misleading. <laughs> okay, thank you. So this has been great and I think, uh, you know, sort of with that, I would just like to take a few interventions from the floor and then I'll continue the conversation. The question is, how, like what would be, Methula, your precise, precise prescription? Because I know you, also, you, are, you are also a scientist. And so, uh, so how, what would be your precise prescription to the people of, this part, of the, this part of the border, and also the other part of the border, I mean it's the Tibetan plateau, about how best we can respond to the situation before it is too late in order to save our future, the future of the, the, future, of the future generation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gopal. So, yes, um, so that's right. You know, the Tibetan plateau and the, all the Himalayan glaciers in Nepal and Bhutan and Ladakh have been called the third pole. And it happened that it melts faster than the two other poles. Now, what advice? <laughs> I don't know. But to Nepal, it's not your fault. <laughs> yes, so you should advocate. It's not our fault, but we suffer from it. You know, because a US, average US citizen emit 200 times more CO2 than a Zambian. I don't know about exactly Nepal. A Qatari, 2,000 more times CO2 than an Afghan. So, you know, and even you do everything right, you suffer from, this, from the excess of the other. So, we must somehow advocate powerfully that, you know, please don't uh, continue to consume what you don't need. One is about AI and second is about happiness. So in AI, like, uh, so suppose, like people are bringing in AI self-driving cars. Suppose in AI, in front of that, the AI doesn't have self-driving, the car doesn't have anything. So it doesn't have any wisdom. So it cannot find what is human, what is inhuman. In accident, if something accident happens, it cannot do anything, so accident happens, right? So how can we bring compassion in AI? That is, that is my one question. This, my second question is like uh, happiness and meaning of life. So what is more important? Is it a happiness or meaning of life? How can we take it together? You know, it's the endless, you know, same with so many things, very difficult, but if it really turns true, that artificial, I mean, artificial star, in the end, killed twice as less people on the road in one year. So then, there will be issues where there's like a mind-boggling ethical dilemma, but somehow the overall picture might be better. So if that comes to that, it looks uh, not too bad. So now, besides that, you know, compassion is something that human experience is. You can program it to be choosing you know, a selfless response that will be also programmed by humans. 
What was the second question? Yes. Oh, happiness. Happiness and meaning of life. And meaning of life. Big subject. <laughs> okay, in a nutshell, happiness is not the endless pursuit, the pursuit of endless pleasant sensations. That's the recipe for exhaustion, not happiness. Happiness is a, cl- is a way of being that comes with a cluster of basic human qualities, that each of them is enhanced, like benevolence, inner freedom, inner strength, wisdom, all those together make a meaningful life. So I wanted to ask you, Masula, with, uh, because you have a background in um, Buddhism, what are your thoughts on this phenomena where mindfulness is essentially now being turned into a commodity, uh, especially considering that the fact that this helps members of the population who are able to afford it have access to these services, whereas leaving other members out? Okay, I think I, I got it more yeah. or less. Yeah. So, you know, mindfulness has become very... Um, fashionable, <laughs> but it's, so there are uh, bad aspects like mindfulness, <laughs> but also we should also not throw the, the baby with the water, but also there is this uh, kind of simplistic approach of mindfulness uh, that you can find in different kind of apps and also in the way it can be taught. So from the Buddhist perspective, mindfulness does come originally from Buddhist technique, and if a technique is efficient and wholesome, then it's good for everyone. So it works, and it can be used in a secular way in schools. There are schools teaching meditation to mindfulness. But it's a bit narrow in the sense it sometimes lacks a motivation. When we meditate in Buddhism, we say, may I, become, I'm, I practice to become a better human being, to be at the service of others. So it's not exactly what we mindfulness is about. There's also in Buddhist mindfulness there's an ethical component. And when you say the technical definition of mindfulness is to be mindful of the present moment without judgment. So in a way it's good to be no, no judgment when you feel uh, you know, contempt, self-contempt or anger, not to associate with that. Okay, great. But you know, if your mind is full of hatred, <coughs> you know, Buddhist mindfulness says, well, you have to recognize that it is an unwholesome factor that creates a lot of suffering and therefore it's not, you have a kind of judgment of course. That's one aspect of mindfulness, to see if a mental event is constructive or destructive. Um, and my actual, my, actually, my question was the same question Kavya asked earlier, uh, but uh, in relation to Nepal as a country and how, what it would, would it be ethical if we marketed ourselves as a country of um, Buddhism and uh, uh, yoga and meditation and retreats, uh, how ethical that was. But I think you answered that uh, with uh, Kavya's question uh, earlier. My second question is, uh, mental health is a growing issue, uh, even in Nepal today. Um, and if there was anything, um, any advice you had on destigmatizing mental health in the country. Every type of meditation has a different signature in the brain. It's not the same areas and, and networks that would be activated with focused attention meditation or with compassion meditation or with open awareness meditation. Different. So it's like if you muscle your biceps, you're not muscling your legs. So, uh, so yes, so, but there are certain kinds of many of the mental illnesses which somehow, partly genetic, partly environment, I mentioned the fact that the kids growing in, in big cities, which uh, somehow over time have an effect on changing your brain in the same way through neuroplasticity. And it's well known that depression finds a specific nature in the brain. Actually, mindfulness combined with cognitive therapy works very well. It's called MBCT, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy. And it's especially efficient for people who had um, at least two episodes of serious depression. Problem is a discrepancy between the incidence of mental illness and the funding. Uh, in in UK, for instance, uh, 30% of the medical expense and, and time you spend 
needing care is due to mental illnesses. Only 10% of the budget is for research or treating. So that gap is because of stigmatization. Yeah, my, my question is, uh, throughout your journey, you must be having something to uh, share with us about the way out of um, a world that governed by patterns. I mean, yeah, how do we restore our free will? How do we uh, break free from um, the patterns? So what we can look at is that what he's saying is that AI is all about patterns. Does, you know, and is compassion could be worked around for patterns or is it an antithesis? If I'm correct, I'm just trying to summarize it. Yeah. So now, you know, you could, uh, you could detect uh, more precisely uh, with, through AI, through physiological change, to change in the brain, uh, when someone is, you know, uh, generating and feeling compassion. That's not, it's already something that uh, we, we can do. I mean, there's a clear signature of compassion. doesn't mean that it's the same, eh? that we know everything in the brain about compassion, but certainly we know the areas and we can measure uh, the intensity and there are other physi physiological factors that we could measure. And that could be possibly a help for people to train. I mean, most of the feedbacks are just gimmicks that have absolutely zero value. You know, they think they put you one electrode and you hear birds when you are more attentive. It's just complete nonsense. But no neuroscientists say we are actually measuring compassion. It's just some effect of compassion in different areas of the brain. But compassion is an experience. It's the same thing with, uh, you know, the reduction is view on consciousness. Even you describe the 300 billion neurons, the last one, and no, this is the Blue Brain Project and other things. Even they know exactly what's happening to every single neuron in the brain when you feel hatred or love, or you see red, or you see wonderment. There's nothing, it doesn't tell you anything to what the experience is, subjectively. Zero. You could tell everything from the outside and not know what it feels like to feel compassion. So well, that's why experience is about human experience. And uh, artificial intelligence is not a being. It is intelligent, but it's not fundamentally conscious. So it's not a, a sentient being. So that's the difference between a bunch of calculation and well, ex just to be alive and being. My question to you is, in these, la in these five decades, what have you also noted in terms of areas where you think we need to work on. Maybe there are a certain set of values that we've let go of, or a certain new set of values we need to think about. So what have you noted over the last five decades in terms of values that we may need to work on? Thank you. Frankly, I love Nepal. You know, I live here for the last many years. And uh, I have more of social shock when I go to Europe sometimes. And that's what Nelson Mandela was telling about his jailer. There's always somewhere something, some goodness somewhere in human beings. That sort of nugget of gold that is untarnished, even if it has been buried in dirt, in dirt for 20 years. That potential is there. You just need to bring it at the surface, polish it, care for it, and then it can shine again. So that we should not underestimate the power of transformation of human beings and of the mind. So that's valid for everyone. So what we need more than ever anywhere, in Nepal as elsewhere, is more fraternity, is more compassion, is more cooperation, is working together. You know, the, the fight for survival can be done together, not against each other. Um, something I've noticed in the Buddhists that I've met and something I find really appealing and it's something I noticed in you when we spoke for two seconds before the event is um, the lightness of spirit and the humor. So can you talk a little bit about the relationship between Buddhism and humor? So there are many kinds of humor. You know, I was uh, recently on this book on wonderment, I mean, French radio, and commentator said, 
say, what's nice what to have you is you are never cynical. I said, well, why should I be cynical? But they are humor where suddenly do something that has been really heavy on your mind and poof, disappears because the whole, you know, it's like a big drama. So when the dilemma is sometimes you're asking a very deep question and he giggles. It's not that he can't help giggling all the time, <laughs> but he finds that it's such a kind of play. It's like a, you know, all this worldly consideration, gain and loss, praise and criticism, you know, fame and anonymity. It's all such a joke in effect. So if you see that, it's like a big theater. So if you, if you, if you laugh and joke about it, so then you, know, you can really uh, you know, devote your time to more serious matters in your ways. So any, any final words you'd like to say before we close? Anything? Uh, well, my favorite one was easy. Yes. So one day we were in Tibet again, and there was a wonderful doctor. He was from the USA, but he was from Native American. And so we worked together for a month, you know, with our, our clinics, and uh, like that we have clinics here with Karuna and also in India. And one morning at breakfast, he came with a very inspiring letter he had written, quoting Mother Teresa and all that. And he, he, he wrote us to that in, in the breakfast with so much. You know, enthusiasm. And then uh, I sort of you know, look at him, and without being sarcastic, I say, you know, all this can be subsumed in four words. Be good, do good. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew La, for you know, gracing us today and for amazing conversations. You know, I mean, before I end, I have to thank Team Bead, Hotel Himalaya team, Karuna Sachin, Embassy of France team. Thank you, Suji. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador and your wife. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Himalayan Himalaya Hotel. Thank you, the Karuna team. Thank you, everybody.